Thanks for tuning in. Please join in the conversation by sharing your comments with us below. Well, welcome to this uh, podcast with me, Mabon Ap Gwynfor and Liz Saville Roberts, a member of Parliament for Dwyfer Mirionydd. Uh, and joining us today is Councillor Dilwyn Morgan over in Bala, not only a councillor representing Bala, but also on Gwynedd Council's Cabinet, looking after young people and children. Uh, da to you both, da Dilwyn in Bala. Boreda. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'll just start off by telling you a little bit about what's going on in our community here. Um, it looks a long, long time ago when all this started, really. Um, people are tending to forget how it was, even. Um, people have told me on the street, we can't remember how it was before. Um, and it came all of a sudden to a, a little community like us. It was at the start it was something that was happening somewhere else mm. um, and people were actually telling me on the street oh we'll be okay it'll never come here to bala and then overnight it actually did happen businesses were closing pubs and shops were closing um, no traffic on the street um, and it was here and um, it's amazing really that, that that actually sparked off this this community um resurgence really the, the feeling of of community and how people have actually come together to help people either in need help each other um and and that's something i really need to keep going really it, it's such a fantastic feeling to be part of of this community which seems to have woken up all of a sudden mm, mm, mm. and and th that's great to hear you know that bala has responded so positively in looking after each other but uh, Liz that's a theme isn't it that we've had in these conversations uh, when we've looked at communities across the Vermeer and I'm sure it's true across Wales as well that we've seen communities pull together uh, and neighbours working together looking after each other isn't it? I think that's been one of the really heartening things to see coming out of the very very difficult time is, is, is the, the, the growing resilience in our communities some of them really stepped up to the mark you know, mm. right at the beginning and the resilience has grown of course people have learned to use these new skills we're using these means of communication which you know it allows us to do things which we wouldn't have been able to do before and, it's, and i think it, it's, it's increased our confidence and of course i think confidence is one of the the key things that we should all of us be looking at how can we be confident that we're doing the right thing to remain safe because that confidence will then feed into other aspects of our lives as well mm -hmm. true enough now Dilwyn, um I certainly know you from the small screen, having seen you on, on television presenting various programmes um, uh, on S4C. But as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, podcast, you've also got a very important role on Gwynedd Council's Cabinet, looking after children and young people. W what does that entail? What does it mean? What, what, what is that role? Yes, it's, um, it's officially children's services, supporting families and um, the youth service and um it's it's a it's an amazing job really and i could be here all day talking about this because i'm so passionate about it the trouble with children's services is um i must say we they do the job so well that mm. they don't actually get much recognition um not much publicity until something bad happens mm. um and, and and i keep telling them we need to sort of you know Camel, what's camel in English? Compliment. Yeah, we need to compliment more of the staff and the service that is provided. Um, because here we're talking about very vulnerable children. Indeed. Um, we're talking about safeguarding children that are that are in some sort of um danger, and that could be you know from sexual exploitation to any sort of harm, really. Um. Mm. Uh, and what's frightening, and a lot of people don't realise, this is happening here in Gwynedd. It's not something that's happening in the big cities of, of England and, the, and other parts of the world. It's actually happening here, which, mm. which is a, a big wake-up call for a lot of people, really. Um, mm. So that's part of it. Um, other parts of the service are um, Derwen, which is a partnership with Health. Um, which provides a service for disabled children. We have Havana Ser, which is a respite um, centre in Penryn Daedleth for disabled children. And, and the good news is that's reopening next week, which is, um, which is really good news for families 
um, mm. who have spent months, you know, um, under a lot of pressure, really. Mm. Um, so, so there, there's lots going on, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of it, and I'm very proud of the way we've, we've sort of stepped up to the mark with this, really. Um, we are in contact with all children that we know um, who are in some sort of situation, um, who are on our um, registers and so forth, um, and, and it's amazing uh, what's going on. Well, that's fantastic to hear that uh, you know the the local authority has stepped up and uh, is ensuring the safety and well-being of the children uh, and young people. And of course, as a councillor and the local authority, you're corporate parents for these young people, aren't you? Yes, we're corporate parents for I think it's about um, 290 children uh, this week. Actually, the numbers of children we have in care have actually gone up quite considerably. Mm. Um, but well, the reason for that is that the courts have stopped operating. So um, as today, we have about 25 children who are ready to come out of care or to move on, but we just can't get the courts to deal with, mm. with matters um, at the moment. So that's something that's, that's ongoing yeah. and a bit of a worry, really, because these children um, are obviously ready to go um, you know, and move on with their lives, but they're being held back by paperwork basically yeah 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 well and um, now before pressing the record button there now um liz you were on the phone with the leaders of the other parties in westminster and the prime minister um what did they have to say what did boris johnson have to say well these sorts of meetings are um they come about when number 10 has something they usually want to praise themselves about not surprisingly we, we get a, about 12 hours notice perhaps a little bit more that these meetings are going to happen um in this case what the prime minister was sort of prior announcing i suppose we should count ourselves a bit lucky he announced it with us rather than going straight to the press if the press call was after us it doesn't always happen that way um was various measures of, of uh, relaxing saying the means of are going to work that he's proposing in England to do with public transport to do with um, poss the possibility that they're going to do some pilot schemes on indoor performances of course the, the really important thing to remember with all of these when he's making these announcements these are England only announcements mm -hmm. and it's a constant refrain from us please from but particularly from Wales Scotland from a lesser degree that when the Prime Minister makes these announcements that he is very clear because there's such a risk of mixed messages between what's happening in England and Wales, there's enough risk of mixed messages within our, our own nations within Wales and within England as well. Um, he was also announcing three billion extra pounds for the English NHS in preparation for the winter months. So I asked him the, um, the not rocket science question that uh, Ian Blackford of the SNP and us, those of us, myself from Plaid Cymru, always ask, okay, if England is getting this amount of money, this three billion pounds, what are we going to get? Because the, the standard term, what they talk about, the, the anorak term is Barnet Consequentials, is that Wales gets a percentage according to the size of the population of Wales mm. in relation to what England, England gets. So we get, we would expect, should expect, just over 5% because that's the population equivalent. So I asked Boris Johnson, will we be getting the full population equivalent for Wales, which is, as I said, a really predictable question because we ask it every time. Mm. And he said he'd have to come back to us on that. So I wasn't that impressed with that, frankly. Um, the other issues that I pressed upon, uh, one that we've been working upon is this idea, if you're gonna have local lockdowns, you have to make sure they work. Mm. Now bear in mind that we're still in the full furlough arrangements. These haven't been reduced at all. Furloughs are going to start going down when employers have to pay national insurance and, and pensions. Um, we firmly believe that for local lockdowns like Leicester, which is still ongoing at the moment, um, that you you must make sure that people can afford to stay home, that they not, haven't got the perverse incentive of having no work, only having statutory sick pay, and then looking for work, and they're not actually you know, abiding by what the whole point of the local lockdown is. So there's an opportunity to raise that again. And the final thing that I raised, of course, which is really, I think, important to us, is that is the UK government have a home insulation scheme on the go. Yeah. We have some of the oldest housing in Western Europe. Mm. We really need these sort of, you know, to, to face the cold winter, 
the fuel poverty of winter. Home insulation is a really important opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is exactly the same time that we've got um, Welsh farmers looking, you know, they're getting pennies for the fleeces off their lambs. This is green, sustainable, fantastic insulation. Mm -hmm. So I did a, 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 a push job on that, please, for the Prime Minister. And I think that that actually, that there might be some, um, some take up on that as well. For Welsh wool to be being prioritised for use in, in home insulation. Um, so those are the issues that we raised today. Um, it's quite interesting to have an update on it. I think we, we, we're still back next week to quite a lot of votes. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I look forward to the moment when I say that we've actually stopped with it. But, but there's hope there that at least with, with Welsh lamb, um, wool, we'll see something hopefully moving forward so that farmers here in Wales will be paid more for their fleeces than what they're currently being paid for. It would be really yeah. good news and exactly the right time to put insulation in people's houses Absolutely. and for farmers to get decent pay for their for the yeah. wall off the back yeah. of their sheep. Let, let's see if we can push that a little bit further. Thank you for that work, Liz. Now you you've touched there on on the impact of, of the coronavirus. You mentioned furlough scheme and on the economy. It's well documented now the impact on the economy. Um, we also know of the health impact of this virus uh, on the elderly, especially and the most vulnerable health ways. But to my mind, the one section in society that seems to have been forgotten uh, is the, well, are our young people and, and children. We haven't heard their voices during this lockdown and this crisis. Uh, and, and how, Dylan, with your expertise in that field, how has it impacted on, on young people and, uh, uh, and vulnerable children in, in uh, the last few months? I think to be positive to start off with, um, there's lots of positive anecdotal stories coming out of exp the experience of children, especially the children in care. Um, mm. Children we've already got on our radar. I think um, they've had quite a positive experience on the whole. My, my concern really is the children out there who are not quite within our service they don't actually reach the, th the threshold at the moment and that's the, the same for families they don't quite get help because they're not quite in that desperate set situation yet mm. and um, as a service we we're very concerned about them um, because they're just out there in this gray area mm. um, so, so that, that's a major concern really and the concern again is when will they come you know for our services will mm. they come will they reach that threshold so lots of work going on at the moment to work with communities to look at people that are going to become vulnerable or trying to stop mm. them becoming vulnerable and a, a lot of effort is going into that at the moment yeah. um yeah. you know p we, you're looking at people losing their homes and, and stuff like that so it's very important that we actually are out there um, talking to them and, and, and trying to help them now and not waiting for them to actually knock on our door and say, I'm homeless or I haven't got food or whatever, mm -hmm. or, you know, like we can't look after the children anymore. So, mm -hmm. so, so they're the concern, really. Because mm. I, I think it, Dr. David Tuttle of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in uh, uh, a uh, Senedd Committee recently said that children had suffered collateral damage due to this uh, uh, coronavirus. You know, as, as we mentioned, they, they've been largely forgotten, but a lot have felt isolation and anxieties at home and because maybe of parents' stress or um, bullying online or various other uh, things. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't initially a fan of, of the schools going back in early July. I was I was concerned. I've, I'm a parent of four children myself. Um, but I, I didn't realise at the time that the point wasn't necessarily just for educational purposes, but also that role that schools and teachers play in monitoring child health, ensuring that um, they're looked after mentally and physically. And I didn't really fully appreciate that role and the fact that that, that um, the local authorities didn't really know what was going on with some of the most vulnerable children. So that's helped you out, I'm sure, to see those children going back to school and ensure that they are getting the care that they should have during this pandemic. Yes, um, and a lot of the work that's been going on in the background really is 
um, teachers and social workers working together. Mm. Um, I, I know for a fact that um, schools have been in contact with every child through Gwynedd that are on our vulnerable uh, list. Mm. And if they don't get a positive answer or mum and dad won't answer the phone, then they will work with a social worker and they will actually go and knock on that door to make sure that child is okay. So mm. lots of work like that has been going on, um, which is positive. But as I said, my worry is the children that don't actually get that knock on the door because nobody's realised they could be in a vulnerable position. Yes. Uh, Liz, when I introduced Dillwyn, I, I mentioned that my concern was young people and children's voices wasn't being listened to, wasn't heard during this uh, uh, the crisis. But I know that you've um, reached out and spoken to a number of young people, haven't you? I've spoken to uh, some young people who are attending College Mary on Duvor, so people between the age of 16 and 18. And um, I mean, and, and, and it, it, as soon as you start thinking about it, you can understand why they're concerned because they're looking at how do they gain the qualifications now that will decide you know, the, the route that they take, they take for the rest of their lives, be that through mm. to university, you know, what will be the qualifications, they're gonna get their qualifications in a different way to how all their friends and their older brothers and sisters have done. They're not gonna have exams in the same way. Um, they're gonna be anxious about that process. Again, also for those who are following um, vocational routes, how are they going to get their assessments in, particularly if they're practical assessments? What are the routes ahead for them and the sort of skills that they, that they have afterwards? But I think one of the things that, that really struck home is that sense among young people of you know, the, the, the natural anxiety. And I, it has to be said that the, the college is doing everything it can to, to make sure that the, the process is, is the right process and it's carried out thoroughly and that the checks and balances are all there. They're doing the best they can. But of course, what the college can't do in all honesty is, is replace those, if you like, rites of passage mm. moments. Mm. That moment when you've done the last exams, um, that moment when you leave, that moment when you gain your results in the same way, um, people's 18th birthdays, all those big events have had to happen in a different way. Mm. And if, for those young people, I think sometimes, yeah, we, 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 need, we need to appreciate, although in some ways having more time, I think, has been possibly best beneficial for many families, but for also some people, they will just have missed out on something which which they had assumed was going to be on the pathway of their lives. Yeah, yeah. And Dilwyn Liz has touched on something um, important and positive there, that element of more time maybe with some families. Looking forward now, um, uh, as we come out of this uh, first wave maybe, and as we look forward maybe for a second wave, what have we learnt uh, from this process and what lessons can we take out of it uh, and learn from them for the future? I think there's lots to be learned. I think this is one thing. Technology, definitely. Um, it's, it's actually made the contact between some of our vulnerable families and the social workers or whoever um, more possible. You know, um, in the old days, the, I don't know whether to call them the good old days or the bad old days, um, meetings would get cancelled, you know, mm. like family support meetings, that sort of, which is very, very stressful for families. You know, they'd be looking forward, building themselves up to go to this meeting in front of this panel. Um, so we've learned a lot that technology can help there. Mm. Um, and that's the same with schools as well. This distance learning is, is I think, the way forward in the future. Mm. Um, and I think one of the biggest lessons, we're getting lots of anecdotal stories about how children in care have got so much new experiences because they are not pushed to go to school straight away. They, okay. they, 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 might, they might have to move home or they might be put with new foster parents. Well, in the, in the old days, um, first week straight to a new school. And the stress on those children um, must, must have been horrific, you know, just imagine yourself going to a new family, a new home and a new school. So um, it's really positive, um, the feedback from families and these children, that they've enjoyed that sort of two, three weeks with no school, just staying at home, building relationships with, with their new um, foster parents or guardians or whatever. So lots of positive lessons there. Um, Moving forward, I think 
staff resilience is a major worry mm. because these these people a lot of them are, are young social workers working from home um you know not being able to go to the office have a good cry have a cuddle with somebody and and just talk about because some of them are facing real um you know hard to mm. live with experiences seeing children that are being abused and so on and so that's definitely something we've learned we need people to work as a team and to actually see each other so it's not all technology mm. um, and i think that there's an important message there isn't there you know sometimes we can look at large organizations like a, a local authority as a faceless bureaucratic organization but there are real people working within the organization in very difficult circumstances helping some very difficult vulnerable traumatizing people and they themselves will suffer those anxieties and and you have a duty of care towards those people working with you in the local authorities helping the young children and people and towards those young children isn't it yeah i think one sort of corporate thing positive that has happened is um, staff have been given more freedom to deal with problems mm. um trying to do away with staff specialisms and, and passing people from one to another um staff have been given this all of saying well you deal with it you sort that person's problem out and i think that's extremely positive um a good positive way forward really um up, and coming out of this, and empowering up, up skilling, empowering them telling you sort it out and it's amazing um the staff what mm. they've done you know it's it's and it's definitely a way forward of working fantastic well listen uh time's flown by this di discussion it's such an important topic uh, the way we look after young people the most young vulnerable young people and children in our midst uh Dylan, i know you're an extremely busy person so thank you very much for your time liz once again you're so very busy i know but thank you for your time uh during this podcast thank you both lovely